Last Sunday, my wife got mad at me. And it wasn't my fault. Normally, nor, now listen, 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 listen. I will admit that normally it is her fault. And, and last Sunday, my wife was mad at me. You see, last Sunday morning at approximately 3.30 in the morning, I started poking her. And I said, hand me the... Hand me the, hand me the thing. And she said, what? And I said, hand me the thing. She said, I think you're sleeping. And I said, I'm not sleeping. Hand me the thing. I'm hot. Hand me the, the thing. And at our house in Ohio, our fan had a remote control, and I would sleep with it near the bed uh, so that if I got hot at night, I, I could turn it on. I hate being hot when I sleep. Now, Brooke, if, I'm... She would sleep under 14, she does, she sleeps under 14 blankets. It doesn't matter if it's July and the air conditioning's blaring, she's got to be under 14 blankets. And I'm just like, I just want a sheet, and even then half the time I'm like, oh, it's so hot in here, this is miserable. And so I'm like, hand, hand me the thing. And she's like, what thing are you talking about? I said, I'm hot, hand me the thing. She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you're sleeping. And I said, I'm not sleeping. Hand me your arm. And she said, why do you want my arm? And I said, because it's got the controls on it. And she said, you don't know what you're talking about. And I said, I do know what I'm talking about. Hand me your arm. I'm just going to eat your arm, and it's going to be cold in here. And she's like, why would you eat my arm? Like, we're on an episode of The Walking Dead. And I'm like, I just want to eat your arm to get to the thing that goes with the TV. And she said, the remote? And I said, yes. And she said, why would you eat my arm to get a remote? That doesn't make any sense. And I said, I don't know. I just need to eat your arm. And she said, wake up. You're asleep. And I said, I'm not asleep. And she said, you are screaming. The people in the, the, people in the apartment are going to hear you. And I said, I don't care if the people in the apartment hear me. It's really hot in here. And that's all I remember vaguely. And then I woke up the next morning, and it's kind of that feeling when you wake up like, you know something happened, but you're not really sure what happened. And I just wake up to a wife in bed next to me who was mad. And it's that, like, you just wake up, guys, and you just know, well, it's going to be a rough day today because she was mad. She said, did you enjoy yourself last night? I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, are you serious? I got like no sleep after 3.30 because of you. And I'm like, what did I do? And then as she started to explain it to me, it kind of all came back to me, just a little bit at a time. Now, I don't know if I was having a dream. I don't know if I was delirious. I don't know what state I was in, but it was something between a dream and it was something between my reality and it was a state that I can recall a lot of what transpired but there was a lot of craziness that went on as well and over the next couple of weeks we're gonna see something as we've called dreams of Christmas and it's not crazy like my whatever state I was in last week where I just really wanted to be cooler than what I was but it's a state or a dream or a vision where God intervened with ordinary people to begin the process of announcing the most extraordinary news that we would ever be given. We're going to see how God intervened in the lives of people in dreams and in visions to get them ready for what was to come in Jesus' arrival to this world so that we could have hope, so that we could have peace, so that we could experience love. And we're calling it Dreams of Christmas because Visions of Christmas just sounds weird and we don't know what else to call it. So some of these things happened in dreams, some of these things happened in visions. But we look at Christmas as it's a magical time, and it is. It brings about joy, it brings about laughter, it brings about community, brings about, in many cases, generosity. 
It brings about all of these things. And yet the first Christmas, it was full of angst and uncertainty and even heartache. It was the time that God intervened, that the supernatural came and met the natural. And he intervened in our world so that he could intervene in our lives. When God worked in the heartache of a family who couldn't conceive. When God worked in the uncertainty of a man whose fiance, whom he loved dearly, had become pregnant and he knew that he wasn't the father. And so the question of how do I proceed and what do I do? When God worked in the midst of accusations and whispers. When God set his plan in motion to save us. That is what we're going to look at over these next couple weeks. And so this morning we just start in Luke chapter 1. So if you have your Bible apps, you can follow along on your phones or tablets. And if not, it'll be on the screen where we read this. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. And so as we look at the arrival of Jesus, we're going to see the prequel today. And it's the story of a a guy named Zechariah, who's a priest, and his wife, Elizabeth. Now, Zechariah is a priest. He's a holy man. He's doing the best that he can. And his wife, Elizabeth, she's a righteous woman. They're both living lives that, that are honorable, that are good. They are striving to serve God. They're striving to seek after God. These are people who are doing the right thing. And yet they find themselves in a situation that is heartbreaking. find themselves in a situation where they're older and all their dreams and all their desires and all their wishes to have a family of their own have not played out. Maybe you can relate. You go back and you think of when you were a little kid and all the dreams, the ways that you saw your life unfolding the joy that you had when you first got married and all the plans that you made that together you would set off and you would start a family and raise kids together one day only to discover somewhere in that journey that that wasn't going to be possible for you. Nobody understands that pain until they've endured it themselves, of somebody who desperately wants to have a child and who can't. Endless nights of anger, frustration, of sorrow, The feelings of disappointment, one visit to the clinic after another, after another, wanting desperately for the doctors to find something different this time. If only they could try this treatment, maybe this treatment would be different. If only, if only, if only, and yet every scenario leads to another closed door. Unless you've been there, you don't know the pain and the frustration and the heartache and the nights that you just can't sleep. The tears are gone because they've all been cried and the frustration mounts. You start to have to let go of dreams that you've dreamed since the time you were a child. And all too often, you feel like you have to walk through it alone. Because other people just wouldn't understand. They just don't get the frustration. They just don't get the heartache. They just can't 
fathom in their minds what you're going through and what you're feeling. And then you start to wonder, was it something I did? Is it something that's wrong with me? Is it something that's wrong with you? Why is it like this? God, why would you do this to us? Where are you? Why wouldn't you just intervene? you've been there, you don't know the toll that that can take on a marriage and an individual and the hurt. And if that's you, I just want to encourage you today. First of all, you don't have to walk that path alone. Now, I understand you may want to because there, there, people are private about certain things. And, and I'm not suggesting that you share that news with anyone and everyone. Though if you want to, that's perfectly fine. That's up to you. That's your choice. But I do want to encourage you, don't walk through that battle and that struggle alone, feeling like there's nobody that you can reach out to. That you have to bear all of the burden of those broken dreams and that, that hurt and that anguish alone. And it's okay. It is okay to weep over those broken dreams. It is okay to have those feelings. And it is okay to express your frustration with yourself. It's okay to express your frustration with God. And you don't have to walk through that journey alone. I would challenge you not to. To find somebody that you can confide in. I want to encourage you. Rally together as a couple. This will help strengthen you or it will help separate you. And the choice that you're going to have to make is whether or not you're going to allow this trouble to bring you together or whether you're going to allow this to separate you as a couple. Where the frustration is now, instead of being geared at the situation, it's now pointed to an individual. And I want to encourage you that you are not less of a man or a woman. You are not less of an individual. That your masculinity or your femininity is not tied into your ability to have children. And I know that so much of our culture puts such an emphasis that if you're a family, well, you have to have kids, but... You don't. And I know that that's a message that doesn't help if you desperately wanted to have children. But it does not make you any less valuable. It does not reduce your worth. As a husband and as a wife, it does not reduce your worth as an individual if you are biologically unable to have kids. So I just want to encourage you, if you're in that boat, don't believe the lies that are so easily promoted, both in our culture and sadly, sometimes within the church. Because it's not the case. And so here we have Zechariah. And we have Elizabeth. And we have their heartache. But what we see is that they're people who love God and who serve God. And what we see here is that infertility is not a punishment. Infertility is not a punishment. It's just sometimes a reality of the world in which we live. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. 
Now, this was an incredible honor to be the person selected to go in and to burn the incense in the temple in the most holy of places. And it's a special incense. The recipe was found in Exodus 30. It was very sweet smelling. And it was, it was a limited, it was limited. The incense was limited, only available in the temple. So it wasn't available at the local essential oil party. They couldn't just go down and, and stock up on this incense. It was unique to the temple. It was only available there. And as Zechariah is lighting the incense and burning the incense in the most holy of places in the temple, an angel appears. He has a vision. And an angel shows up. And he is scared out of his mind. It's like when you're watching a horror movie all alone and you decide, ah, the kids are in bed and my spouse is away. This will be fun. And you turn off all the lights and then every creak you hear in the house, you are convinced this is where I go to die. This is where my life ends, right here tonight. He is freaking out. Out of nowhere, this angel shows up as he is burning incense. Now, I, I know what some of you are thinking. I know what some of you are thinking. No, he wasn't stoned, all right? And I get it. I get it. Because some of you have been burning something and inhaling for an hour, and you've seen some visions too. But that's not what's going on here. Zechariah is not high, all right? He's burning the incense in the most holy of places. An angel shows up, and he is scared out of his mind. And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Hey, Zechariah, don't be afraid, which is so easy for the angel to say, right? <laughs> Don't be afraid. God has heard your prayers and going to be answering them in a way that is bigger than anything you could ever imagine. And maybe you find yourself there today. Where prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer prayer has been offered. wonder where is God? Day after day after day, you just pray that your kids would make the decision to follow Jesus. God, why would you not answer that prayer? What is wrong? What are you doing? Where are you? Yeah, it's another night you go to bed. And tomorrow you'll do the routine all over again, and you start to wonder, am I just wasting my time? Does this even matter? What is wrong? Or maybe you're in a position where you have found yourself in a situation that is harder than anything that you could ever imagine. You didn't sign up for this, but you found it. And it's not fair what's happened to you. And it's not right. And it's not just. And you're you're angry and you should be angry because of what you've had to endure. And you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed for God to intervene. For God to do something in your life to bless you instead when it seems like he's blessing the people who have done the wrong thing. And you just start to wonder, God, what are you doing? Where are you? Would you please intervene? Do you even care? you go to bed angry because God could do something 
but he's not. And you're mad. Or maybe you've just given up entirely. You say, what difference does it make anyways? I've tried. And it didn't do any good. So why bother? Why waste my time? What's the use? And here is a priest in a temple burning incense. And an angel shows up, scares him to death. And it says, God's not done with you. God's not done. And my guess is that tonight, no matter what incense you burn, an angel isn't going to show up to you. But I promise you the message is the same. God's not done with you. God's not done in your situation. God's got something bigger in store. God's got a bigger plan in store than we can even understand. And oh, by the way, in the case of Zechariah, it's going to look like we think it should look, but sometimes it doesn't. And that's where faith kicks in. Because God is bigger than us. God is greater than us. And we can't always understand everything that God is up to and everything that God is doing. But how could we? We're not God. So much of what we're going to see during dreams of Christmas is God intervening in ways that we would be like, whoa. That blow our minds. Because God is not confined to our understanding. God is not confined to our ways of doing things. God is so much bigger and so much greater. God has heard your prayers. He's answering your prayers. He's going to answer them and bigger ways than you ever even imagined. He's going to give you a son. He's going to give you a son that would grow to be John the Baptist, who was the opening act for Jesus. He set the stage. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And so the angel shows up, and he starts talking to Zechariah, and Zechariah says, prove it. Prove it. I'm old, my wife's old, we aren't having kids, that's done, this isn't, this isn't going to work, she's too old for that, I'm too old for that, it's not happening, so here he is, I love this, lighting incense In the most holy of places, an angel shows up, he tells him something, and he says, nah. And you think God's scared by your doubt, right? Like so many times we're like, whoa, I don't don't know about all these things, but I better not communicate it to anybody. I better not speak. 
I better not share that with anybody. I better just fight that battle on my own and not tell anybody because of what they'll think about me or what God's going to think about me. God sends his angel to the temple to tell Zacharias something. Zacharias says, that's not going to happen. And we think God's intimidated by our doubt. Doubt is not the enemy of your faith. In fact, we've been given a promise. Lean into it and ask God to reveal himself to you. God is not scared by your doubt. God is not intimidated when you struggle with concepts that are bigger than we can fully grasp and fully understand. The most destructive thing that you can do is to fight that battle alone. The most destructive thing that you can do is not talk to anybody about it. The most destructive thing that you can do is run away from God, fearing that you've disappointed Him as a result of having things that aren't clear. Be trouble in your mind. You know what else we see here? That God's answers to our prayers don't always come on our time frame. And they don't always look like we think that they should look. Here's Zechariah and Elizabeth, and for years they've prayed, for years they've wept, for years they've just desired to have And now they're going to have a kid. When it seems like they're too old to have a kid. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And people are like, what's going on with Zechariah? What ha- what, what's taking him so long? What's the deal? And then when he came out, they just looked at him and saw that something was different. They saw that he had undergone something, that he had had an encounter that had changed him. They realized that he had seen something. I don't know what kind of train wreck he looked like as he's sitting there and trying to motion to them things and he can't talk. And I don't know what they're thinking, whether he's just completely lost it. He's gone crazy. I don't know what they're thinking, but they're like, something has happened. Then he went home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So she becomes pregnant. They don't tell anybody right away because when you've dealt with this, you don't, and you want to make sure that things are going along, that everything's proceeding well. She's pregnant with John, who would be the opening act for Jesus. And this is what's crazy. The miracle of the birth of Jesus starts with God reaching down and changing a family to bring about a child who would proclaim the one who would come to change us all. Now, we no longer have to go to the temple to access God because of what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. 
fact, we all can have a relationship with God as a result of what Jesus has done for us. And today, we're going to celebrate that. But as we kick off Christmas and as we see how God had changed one family, I want to invite you to know that God wants to change you. And maybe there's something that you've been holding on to for a really long time. Maybe it's the hurt of something that you have dreamed about since the time you were a child that hasn't come to pass. Maybe you've been the victim of something. You have been wronged, and you feel like there is no justice, and you feel like if, if God really cared, he would have never let this happen to me. So you become bitter. Or maybe you're just hurt. But you're not whole. You've allowed that hurt, you've allowed that bitterness to creep inside and to change you a little bit at your core. Maybe you've thrown in the towel. Because you have wanted and prayed for something for so long that hasn't come to pass. So you just say, I'm done. What's the use anyways? Or maybe there's some things about God that just don't make sense to you. And there's some doubt that's crept into your mind, and, and you just can't get past that, and you can't work through it, and it just really bothers you that you don't understand every facet of God on every level that you want to understand, and it just cuts to the core, and so it causes you to question, do I even really believe? So you've allowed that doubt to push you away. Here's the deal. God wants to change all of us. God is not scared by your hurt. God is not scared by your disappointment. God is not scared by your doubt. And when we bring that hurt, and we bring that disappointment, and we bring that doubt to Him, and we offer ourselves... It doesn't magically make it all go away. But it does help us rest in the fact that God is bigger than us. That He is in control. And He loves us. So much that with my doubt, with my hurt, with my heartache, He still wants all of me and all of you. And that's what the birth of Jesus is all about, that He would come to this world so that we could have a relationship with God. He would come to this world to pay the price that I can't pay for my shortcomings, for my mistakes, for my sin, and He would die on a cross for me so that I could have a relationship with Him. And if you've made the decision to follow Jesus, then in a minute... I want to invite you to join us as we're going to pass out a reminder of that incredible cost for us to have a relationship God, with God. When we pass out bread that serves as a symbol of the body of Jesus broken for us, and we pass out juice which serves as a symbol of the blood that Jesus poured out for us because God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for me so that in him 
I could have a relationship with God so that in him I could be righteous before God, so that in him all of my imperfections, all of my hurt, all of my heartache, all of my doubts disappear. And God sees me as perfect because of what Jesus did. God wants to change you today. So I'm going to pray. And then we're going to pass this out and just hang on to it. And I'll come back up and we'll take it together. God, thank you for meeting us in our hurt. For meeting us in our heartache. For not being intimidated by our doubts. But for loving us in amazing ways. God, I pray whatever the source of hurt. That your spirit would comfort. God, that in the days where it feels like you're so distant and you're so far away and you're just not answering anything, that you would intervene. God, that you would change us. Help us see your love. Help us remember why you came and may we leave different thank you for your love thank you for giving us a second chance thank you for redeeming